Welcome to The Great Work Radio Program. The Great Work Radio and Blog are features of Jesse War's website and can be accessed at jessiewar.com. That's J-E-S-S-E-W-A-U-G-H dot com. We look forward to comments submitted to the blog and hope you enjoy today's program. This week we talk with author Levana Morgan, who has just released her newest book, which is entitled A Witch's Mirror, The Art of Making Magic. Levana reveals some of the details of secret rituals in which she has taken part, as well as describing beautifully her experiences with practical witchcraft, a type of witchcraft which can be seen as more personal and less ritualistic. She discusses special magic having to do with experiencing the sea and its tides as an alternative and in fact an opposite kind of meditation, while embracing and exalting the senses to a climax of perception. Cecil Williamson and Harroward Wake are discussed at length, especially in their function as mentors to Levana, and the author recounts anecdotes, spells, and workings she experienced in their presence. Levana Morgan is a former chair of the Museum of Witchcraft in Boss Castle, Cornwall, England, which was founded by Cecil Williamson, beginning with a vast collection of paraphernalia he had amassed. I begin by asking Levana about the theme of her book. Well, it's um, a book about the pra- very practical aspects of witchcraft. I find very often when people write about witchcraft, it's sort of telling you how to do rituals. It's about very abstract con- concepts. What I've tried to do in this book, uh, which follows the way I was taught and also the way I've taught other people, is just teach them to make things and do things. And it's through the actual experiential aspects of those things, of making things, of doing things, maybe making a physical object, maybe um, sitting out in a forest all day, that I think people will get a very profound uh, experience of magic and witchcraft. So that, that's the basis for the book. It was launched uh, only 9th of March, which is lovely, at the Pagan Federation's Devon and Cornwall Conference in Cornwall. There are about uh, 250 people there for the conference as well as the book launch, you know, I hasten to add. And that, that was great. It, it was very successful. I had to find a lot of copies and it was lovely to talk to people about the book. People were kind of reading it there and we were chatting about it. So it was a very, very lovely way to launch the book, I think. And great full thanks to my lovely publishers, Capel Band, for making that possible. And where was it at exactly in Cornwall? Okay, it was at Penstone Manor, which is a kind of conference center and holiday place. It's about four miles from Bude in North Cornwall. It's in a village called Kilthampton, and it's a, a quite um, kind of quiet part of Cornwall, and it's in an area where there are lots of holy wells, which is rather lovely. Oh, nice, yeah. Mm. Uh, okay, was it in, uh, in association with the Museum of Witchcraft at all or no? Uh, it wasn't actually in association with the museum, but um, I've worked with the museum for a number of years. One of my two very influential teachers of witchcraft was Cecil Williamson, who founded the museum. And after the current owner, uh, Graham King, took over, I've been very closely involved with setting up the museum's friends organization and working with them as a volunteer. And so quite a lot of the magic I've done over a long time, or witchcraft I've done over maybe, oh gosh, makes me feel really old, 30 years, has been um, very closely linked to the museum in lots of ways. What I did was, um, when in 1997, when Graham King took over the museum, I'd worked in the arts for quite a long time, and I thought, well, all these other museums have friends organizations to uh, generally support what the new museum does and raise funds for them. And although the Museum of Witchcraft is not a publicly owned museum, 
like most others. I thought, well, why shouldn't it have one too? Because there are loads of people out there, like all over the world, I have to say, who love the museum and support its work. So I started a friends organization, which is run on an informal basis. And I don't know if you know, but in 2004, on the 16th of August, the village of Boscastle, where the museum is, suffered a horrendous flood. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I was in Britain at the time. Yeah, I saw it on the news. Absolutely awful. And, you know, it it was a miracle that lives were not lost. The whole village was trashed. So um, the museum uh, survived fairly well, although it had five feet of water in Did the it? ground floor. Yeah. Miraculously, um, most of the objects, except a few incredibly fragile things, survived. And there was a huge kind of rallying round in the witchcraft community and the pagan community, and also just in North Cornwall, to um, raise funds for the museum and help put it back to right. So at that point, we got the Friends of the Museum constituted as a charity. I think it was the first charity to do with witchcraft, which was a bit of a breakthrough. And um, I chaired its its board for quite a long time, for seven or eight years. And I'm now its treasurer, and I've handed over the chair to someone else. But I'm still very actively involved in that. The Museum of Witchcraft has a large collection of Golden Dawn memorabilia. What is the history of that? Where did that come from? Do you know? Yes, it does. Um, What's happened with the museum after um, Cecil Williamson passed it on to Graham King is it's become a real repository for um, things that people in the witchcraft and magical community uh, want, want to put somewhere safe. I mean, catastrophic floods notwithstanding. So various people in the Golden, uh, who've been associated with the Golden Dawn have donated physical objects over the years, which is great. So, yeah, there's quite a substantial collection. But what's also very important uh, about the museum is it has one of the largest libraries and archives um, in the world on on the subject of of witchcraft and magic. And there are letters, documents, periodicals, all sorts of things in there that that go back um, to the Golden Dawn, letters from people involved in the last years of its life, correspondence with with Diane Fortune, letters from Crowley, between Crowley and Gerald Gardner, all sorts of wonderful stuff. It's a a fantastic resource. And maybe what your listeners might like to know, if they're not familiar with it, is that the whole collection of of, um, physical objects can be viewed online uh, uh, via the museum's website. And also you can search for any documents that you're interested in. So say you're interested in the Golden Dawn, or Crowley, or I don't know, you know, Alex Sanders, Robert Cochran. There's a wealth of material there which is really easily available for anyone to research. And they would do so by just searching for the Witchcraft Museum and maybe add Cornwall to the search. www.museumwitchcraft.org.uk But if you just just put Museum of Witchcraft Cornwall, you get it. Um, It's very easy to find. And what, what is it about Cornwall? Obviously, Cornwall and Anglesey and Ireland and Scotland all have something in common in, in that they were not uh, very easily conquered by uh, the Romans or the Christians. So th- that has naturally allowed those places to maintain a tradition of uh, witchcraft or paganism or whatever we want to call it. But how much of this new modern paganism, if we, want, if we can call it that, is... Um, post-romantic era? Well, in my experience, there are a couple of things going on. Yes, what you say about the Romans is true, although not Christianity, because um, all those areas were kind of touched by an old form of what became known as Celtic Christianity very early on, before England, but they, they did it in a kind of, I think, as far as I've been able to ascertain, the kind of forgiving, kind of tolerant way. So Celtic Christianity uh, includes a lot of elements of what had been paganism and was very tolerant of of the old paganism itself. So there were those survivals. But there's also a really basic thing, in my experience, is that um, certainly Cornwall and Anglesey, which are two places I know well, Ireland I know less well, were very poor places on the margins of, you know, um, British society um, right up until the beginning of the 20th century. So, you know, old traditions tend to linger on 
in places where people are poor. You, in, in Cornwall, it's really marked. In, in the collections that the museum has, for example, you could not uh, afford a vet if your animals were sick. You probably couldn't afford a doctor if you were sick, but you could go to the local witch, wise woman, or cunning man and, and on a barter basis, you know, get, get something done about it. So the old folk traditions of witchcraft survived in those places for, uh, you know, all to, to within living memory and didn't, didn't die out. So I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that from the 60s onwards, there has been a rather romantic flight to the margins. So um, Cornwall has a large neo-pagan community, and they're, they're very wonderful people, and a lot of them have come there from somewhere else. Not all of them, but, you know, there's been a deliberate movement away from the centre to somewhere that people regard as spiritual and peaceful, uh, where they can practice what they want to practice fairly understood. And it's got quite an honourable history. The um, wonderful surrealist artist, Ethel Cahoon, was one of the first people to do that in the late 1940s. So it's not, you know, it's not a completely recent thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is very definitely people's own personal paganism, a kind of paganism of the heart um, that, that they practice, but that, that, that's their choice, you know. Yeah, and is Glastonbury included in, in this southwest sort of pagan society, or is it like an outpost? Well, I think if you, you, know, if you follow kind of standard definitions of southwest England, although a lot of my Cornish friends would not apply the word to England, to Cornwall, because they feel it was never formally incorporated <laughs> in, into England. So, you know, there's, there's an issue there. But the standard definition of southwest England, um, as well as the Isles of Scilly and Cornwall, would include Devon and Dorset and Somerset, the area around Bristol and Gloucestershire. So, yeah, if you use that, that definition, Glastonbury would definitely be included. And I think there is a sense of magical community which sees... Um, Glastonbury, you know, Devon and Cornwall are, are parts of the same whole. Although the history of Glastonbury is so sort of rich and strange, that of course it has attracted all sorts of other things into itself. So on the one hand, I think it is part of the southwest, but it's got its own um, very unique community and sort of magical flavour, uh, which has built up mainly during the 20th century. And if you uh, if you look at um, wonderful book, the the Avalonians. I'm afraid I, the author's name escapes me. Patrick, someone. That the Avalonians is a really fascinating account of all the people during 20th, early 20th century who went to Glastonbury and sort of made it what it is now, including Darren Fortune. Um, so, so, so yeah, it's part of the general community, but at the same time, it's it's its own particular place, really. Do you think that uh, witchcraft or the old ways or paganism ever actually died out in the UK? Not really. Um, you know, it, it, it's an interesting one. I, th I certainly don't think that they um, survived unchanged as a pagan religion in the way that um, Gerald Gardner might have perceived, and Doreen Balienti might have perceived things in the, you know, 1950s and 1960s. There's no huge unbroken link of one kind of practice going on. But magic survived, folk magic survived, all sorts of traditions and bits and pieces survived. So no, I don't, I don't think they ever really died out. Mind you, where did they die out? In most places you go in the world, there's a tradition of magical and witchcraft practice. If you read Ronald Hutton's history of modern paganism, which I realize is contested, but that's fine, um, The Triumph of the Moon, you know, he, he will contend that the one thing that, that England gave to the world in the 20th century was um, the, the, you know, the, the new form of pagan witchcraft, that it gathered together all the fragments of what people were doing, kind of presented these to the world. And, you know, if you look, if you look at the kind of general practice of, of witchcraft across, I suppose, most of the English-speaking bits of the world, it, by, by and large, it seems to me that with their own additions and, you know, wonderful original contributions, pe people are sort of practicing a model based on that. On the, uh, on the British model. Yeah, suppose, just just about. But but then you know there's so there's so much interesting research on this because of course if you if you look at the work of Owen Davies, he's very interesting. You know he's saying that um, the grimoires from Britain and France went to um, the Caribbean and Central and bits of Southern America 
in the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries and kind of influenced, you know, met and married African diaspora traditions there and, and were an element in creating something new. So I think it's not just in the 20th century. There's a, there's a toing and froing culturally that's been going on for longer than we maybe think about. Yeah, my, most of my exposure to the... To the um kind of alternative um, magical or pagan community ha was in Glastonbury where I lived for two years um, and it got to the point where I was I was thinking that it was all um, definitely like native uh, British um, iconography and uh, folklore and stuff like that but um, I started kind of investigating the green man and there's just as much lore um, and also art production having to do with the green man in the United States as there is in the UK and then also there's um, obviously the tradition of Halloween, which, um, you know, is thoroughly American, and yet it obviously has roots in probably Ireland. The Green Man is extraordinary because you find green men all over the world. There, there's a lovely book on the Green Man by Mike Harding, the, the comedian and folk singer of all people, maybe it's uh, 15 or 20 years old now, where he just collects together instances of a green man from not not just Europe and North America but India and China as well so you know there's there's obviously an image there that that, that people have made all, all over the world and you completely write about Halloween Halloween went from Scotland and it went from Ireland um, to America and you can sort of trace I suppose the roots of American Halloween in, in, in Robert Burns is um, poem Tamashanta, but the Americans do something very wonderful and different with it, and uh, and and you know send it send it back uh, to Britain later. I mean, I, I can remember when I when I was a kid in, in Wales in the north of England in the late 50s and early 60s, celebrating something called Mischief Night on Halloween. But it wasn't it, it wasn't the full blown. Um, witchy experience at all. It was quite, it was quite low-key. So I think the Americans have definitely contributed that. But it's, yeah, you're right, it's like the framework for these things is, is sort of British, which I find surprising and I suppose without wanting to, uh, you know, claim too much for Britain. It, 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 it's surprising and, and it's quite nice. George Harrowwood Wake um, initiated me into the Wiccan tradition in 1990, before that I'd worked on my own a lot and with other sy sympathetic people, but not in a formal way. And he had been a member of um, Dan Fortune's group, the Society of the Inner Light, and involved in various uh, forms of ritual magic where people like Marion Green, Dolores Ashcroft Novicki, and Gareth Knight. Uh, uh, amongst others, and um, I suppose uh, settled on witchcraft as his heartfelt belief, and it was um, a form of Wicca which was basically Gardnerian. He could he could trace his initiatory lineage, although I have to say I'm not really into those those, those kind of things terribly much. Back to Gardner in, in two steps, and so what he was teaching was was basically Gardnerian. Um, but with a terrific form of, of respect for ritual magic and all its practices as well. So from him, I learned Coven Witchcraft, but I also learned all sorts of deep meditational and magical techniques, which were absolutely wonderful, um, which I'm extremely grateful for. He died in 2001 at the age of 92, uh, Cecil Williamson, completely different. Cecil was the um, co-founder, along with Gerald Gardner, of the original Museum of Witchcraft um, on the Isle of Man. Uh, they had a falling out and a parting of the ways. Cecil carried on with the museum. And after it having temporary incarnations in a couple of other places, settled on Boscastle as a site for it in the 1960s. And so he, he, he was a great collector of all the remnants, bits and pieces of folk magic that were around. So he used to um, do house clearances when people died, and he was very good at uh, you know, fi finding... Um, surviving elderly witches and cunning men and learning from them and 
collecting not just their stories, but when they passed on the objects that they worked with, and they became the core of the collection at the Museum of Witchcraft. He'd also, all his life, um, been a practitioner of, of very traditional forms of witchcraft and magic, some, some of them quite, quite dark, but extremely effective. And I was really fortunate to learn a lot from him in the last 15 or so um, years of his life. He, he also died in the early years of this century at a great um, age. So um, he taught me all kinds of folk magic and very practical magic making and his spells and his magic always work. So I was really fortunate to have those, those two fantastic but very different teachers, both of them sadly no longer with us. And one of the things I wanted to do in writing the book was to um, re sort of record my thanks to them and put down some of their um, techniques and practices, you know, so that other people could learn from them. Cecil Williamson um, didn't have a very good press in the history of witchcraft. Um, I think primarily because of his falling out with Gardner, but also because he got up to some amazing things and um, people assumed he was making them up uh, and lying. And he was quite, he was quite a difficult character, but um, Grant King, who runs the Museum of Witchcraft, and I discovered after, after his death, that one of, one of his great stories, which is that he'd worked for MI5 um, during the Second World War using occult and um, magical techniques against the Nazis and, and that he'd particularly been involved in persuading Rudolf Hess to um, defect to Britain. We discovered there was a huge file of correspondence. They were actually true. Wow. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> it was just extraordinary. And so, you know, it was uh, a lot of people assumed that he was a difficult man, not a pleasant man, and that he'd made all this extraordinary stuff up and it couldn't possibly true, be true. And it, but I have to say that after spending a very short time in Cecil's company, it was really easy to discover what, what, you know, what was true and what was a game because he was a great game player and he used to um, use kind of game playing and stories to sort of get rid of people that he felt weren't serious. So, so it was a very complex um, character. There's, there's um, a wonderful Cornish magician and writer called Steve Patterson who's currently writing a biography of Cecil Williamson. I'm not sure when that's out, I think hopefully later this year, so watch out for that one too, because that will be great. Now, uh, Cecil Williamson, if he was involved with MI5, does that um, make any of his claims to being a, a witch or, or sorcerer uh, suspect at all, do you think? Or would, they, would the two different jobs um, sync with each other? They were two different jobs and synced with each other, for sure. I mean, he, you know, his, his witchcraft came mainly from... from other places, but he put it to very good use during the war, from what I can tell. Now, your book seems to uh, deal with the concept of ritual magic, but opposes it to a more uh, naturalistic, uh, perhaps more, perhaps easier or more personal magic. So what is, what is the schism there, and did you learn that kind of concept from your experience working with the Museum of Witchcraft and just in witchcraft in general over the past few decades? Okay, well, the first thing is I don't think there's a schism between the two, okay? I think, um, I mean, they're, they're both sets of practices that I use in my own work. It was just that in this book, I wanted to concentrate on what seem to be quite simple forms of practical magic, but are actually really profound because though I've, I've been teaching those techniques to coven members and students for many years now and people keep saying oh well it would be really useful if, if these things could be more widely available because most of the witchcraft books that are around will explain to you how to do rituals or describe the history of traditions but they don't actually get to the practical techniques so um, I decided to concentrate on those in these in these book rather than the elements of ritual magic that I use mainly I think because um, there are lots of very good works on ritual magic available but not on the other stuff and there is content in the book which is very definitely linked to 
objects and customs that have come from the Museum of Witchcraft as well. So yes, there's that going on there, if that makes sense. So can you give us an example of some of the magic that would be of a more personal or less ritualistic nature? Okay. Well, um, if we look through um, the book, um, it's, it's very deliberately called The Witch's Mirror because I work with mirrors and the idea of light and darkness a lot. So um, I have a chapter on, on magic, what magic is, and some of the very simple but deep magical techniques that I have used and, and would like to pass on to other people. I have um, a chapter about making which is the, the, the tools, what ritual magic we call, call the weapons, um, that witches work with because in the um, tradition I learned from Harrywood Wake, we tried to make everything ourselves for, for good or ill. Things that you make yourself have a power um, that, that things that you buy from someone else just don't have. And I also have, or I hope, it's a quite sort of frugal um, ecological take on life, which is that you find things that aren't in use and you recycle them and you make them into, you, you know, you make them into something else. You don't spend lots of money. So that's my approach to that. Um, there is a large chapter in the book about moon magic and all the different ways that one might work with the moon from using mirrors and light through to um, when to do things, when to harvest things, when to plant, when to sow, etc. There's um, work on the sea and the seashore, which is a space that I find in a lot of modern witchcraft is kind of ignored, which is extraordinary because if you use the tidal rhythms and the idea of the seashore as the liminal space between the land and sea, that's a really um, useful uh, way into magic. There's a whole lot about mirrors and light. So an exa a practical example might be uh, making a dark or black mirror for yourself um, and using that for scrying and seeing spirits and deep work with the spirit world. And what I do is I um, take you through the pr practical aspects of that. So how do you go out and make one? You know, where do, where do you get the stuff? What might you use? How do you actually put it together? And then move into the actual magical aspects of dedicating it, using it, working with it, etc. And then there's um, a large amount of stuff about the kind of magic that might take place in your home um, from making spells and protective charms through to making things to eat. So this is a sort of, I suppose, in many ways, a kind of magical cookbook or recipe book. It's full of things that I hope people would pick up and make and adapt the techniques for themselves, make make their own discoveries, really. That sounds very interesting. Can you give us a couple more examples of uh, different kinds of uh, pro projects that, that you've Different put kinds into of projects. Okay. Well, um, uh, a variety of things. Um, in, I suppose, the more traditional forms of witchcraft, the, the weapon or tool that the witch would probably use more than anything else is a staff, a piece of wood. Um, so I talk about what kinds of wood you might use to make a staff. And uh, I talk about going out to the forest local to me here in Devon in the West Country, which has a particular wealth of ash trees, which we hope are uh, doing magical work for. You really hope are not going to all die this year, thanks to this horrible fungus that is attacking ash trees. But the characteristic of ash trees in Devon in the very dense old forest is that honeysuckle and creepers grow round and into the trees, the, the, the tree kind of um, grows back, so um, you find wonderful spiral um, pieces of wood with, with spirals growing into them. So I talk about how to make an ash staff um, from that and how to um, work with the spirits of the tree that you take the wood from as respectfully as possible. And um, you know, all the practical aspects of how to make that and then I talk about um, how it's used in the practice of traditional witchcraft. It can be used um, to uh, it can be used as an altar space, as an altar. If you're working outdoors, it's used. Uh, Cecil Williamson taught me a lot about how to find the right spot to work with by feeling the pulse of the earth, uh, and it's used to call down spirits. So there's one example. That completely um, 
the other extreme and probably in a slightly more uh, frivolous way, um, I've put a recipe for making slow gin in there because I always go out around Halloween to a particular beach in East Devon where I live and collect slows uh, from the cliffs and make slow gin, which is then used in rites up midwinter. And yes, that's a really wonderful form of strong booze. So there's a whole plethora of stuff in there. There's things about how to make spirit houses, um, how to make witch bottles, just a just, uh, big variety of practical projects, really. I spent my childhood um, living by the sea. Britain has, most of the coasts of Britain have very large tidal ranges. I think um, the Southern Estuary, you know, between Wales and South West England, has the second highest tidal range in the world. The, the, the biggest is in Canada, the Bay of Fundy. But, so if you live by the sea in Britain, you become really aware of the tides. And I realized from a very early age, maybe like four or five years old, that I felt very different when the tide was high and when the tide was low. I didn't have to look at it. I could feel the difference in my own body. And I think all my life I've been fascinated by tidal rhythms, which of course are caused by the moon in conjunction with the sun. The moon is absolutely fundamental to witchcraft and not, you know, looking not just at its phases and its light, but the way its tides affect us seems to me to be um, extremely important. And I've been rather bemused by the way that a lot of modern neo-paganism and witchcraft, you know, which is lovely, is all about um, going out to the woods and celebrating fields and woodlands, but it doesn't seem to take much account of the sea and the tides. So I wanted to do something to redress that balance and make people think about, firstly, how the tides work, how they work in their own bodies, and therefore how they might work magically, um, and how they might influence dreams, sexuality, all sorts of aspects of our being, so there's that. But then there's just a very simple thing, that if you work magic at the seashore um, in a place which is tidal, you're always on the edge. The sea seashore is never the same for two seconds. It's always in a state of flux and change. Um, it never stays still. Things are being brought in by the tide, taken out by the tide. You know, your, your, your footsteps will be washed away instantly. And so it's, it's uh, the sea, that actual meeting place of seeing water is a ver very, very fruitful place to work magic because it's right on the edge. It's the threshold between two worlds. And we spend a lot of time in witchcraft and magic talking about liminal space, space between two worlds. So, so why don't we work more with the seashore where that's happening all the time? in a very powerful way. So that, yeah, that's, that's, that's an original and powerful concept. It really is. And, yeah. and, you know, one of the most magical experiences I've ever had was walking out onto a, a beach in, in, in Anglesey at night, and the tide was out. There was still a little bit of water on the, on the sand, and wind was blowing it into little wisps, and they looked like sea spirits. And the wind was blowing, and you know, like the the blanket I had wrapped around me was blowing behind me. It was just fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Well, maybe I don't know if you would give me the name of the beach. I might well know it because when I said I grew up, uh, my childhood was spent by the sea. It was actually in Anglesey, so it was Anglesey that I think, um, you know, generated all those ideas in me from the earliest times, and it certainly. That sounds um, right, yeah. So I, so I actually know what you're talking about. And then, um, yeah. well, there's a little cove, um, and it's, prob it's the most prominent cove that you would come across as you drive into Anglesey after you've crossed the, the strait or whatever it is. Okay. You're on the island, and you keep going, and it's on your, on your right to the north. Right, okay. It's a and large yes, cove. Well, I can think of several places it could be. Um, and, and the joy of Anglesey is that you've got, like, beautiful small coves like that. Um, one I used to work at a lot was called Portra Castle. That was on the, um, the southern um, side of the island. Um, and somebody had obviously noticed this a lot earlier on in the history of the world than me because there's a really extraordinary um, decorated carved megalithic passage grave looking over the cove on the headland called Barclad de Adagaures. 
Um, so there were tiny, beautiful coves like that, but there are also beaches that go to seven or eight miles. I think and that so, it's Red Wharf Bay. I'm looking at the map. Oh, right Red now. Wharf Bay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That's, that, that's extraordinary. That, yeah. That's huge. Yeah, it yeah. was fantastic. It really was. It just sticks yeah. out in my mind. It was like it was like in 1996 or five or something. It was a long time ago. Oh, yes, it yes. Was wonderful. So, yeah, Red, Red Wharf Bay is really extraordinary. You can walk for miles um, when the tide is out there. And, and you're just where did you, alone. Where, where did you grow up on, in, or live in Anglesey? Well, on the other side, um, or, um, near a village called Rosnager, um, which is which is a quite sort of wild sand dune part of Anglesey. Um, but we had cousins who who lived very near Red Wolf Bay. So again, from a really early age, I was quite familiar with that. Um, yeah, and it's it's um it's a place that people are recognising a bit more now as having great magical importance. I think, you know, it was always thought of until very recently as the place where the Druids made their last stand against the Romans. Right. Um but, you know, the, the, there's there's a lot more going on in Anglesey than just, just thinking about that because it is a place that's on the edge. It's a place that's largely been, with a few bits and pieces and exceptions, largely been left alone to get on with itself. Um, I think I went back, oh, well, I went back there this summer just gone. Um, I'll, I always go back every few years and fear it might have changed and it never does. I think hmm. it's a place where the land and the sea impose themselves on, on, and their meanings on you in a way that is both subtle and profound, but if you have any magical sensibilities about you at all, you, you, you can't fail to notice. Oh, um, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's such a strikingly beautiful place, and it's deeply yeah. beautiful, yeah. Yeah. What, do, what are people calling this kind of movement nowadays? Is it, is it witchcraft? Is it, is it paganism? What do you call it? Alternative? Well, people give it lots of different names. Um, what would you like to call it? I'd like to call it, I'd like to call it witchcraft, I suppose, um, because I think... Um, Paganism has grown as a concept since the 1980s. I have been um, very involved with the Pagan Federation, and I can remember talking to the generation of people slightly older than me who were responsible for starting that, and they settled on paganism um, as a name, and at the time their intention was to kind of try and stop discrimination and fight for some rights mm -hmm. for people who practice witchcraft and they were they were almost entirely Wiccans and they were originally going to call this organization the Wiccan Front but they decided that wouldn't be very helpful this is at the beginning of the 70s so um, they settled on paganism and Prudence Jones who's one of the founders of the whole thing is writes very well about that and um, but what they what they didn't envisage was that they, they did that so successfully that over the years um, people became attracted to the idea of, of paganism per se. So I think now you've got a very wide range of things going on, certainly in Britain. So it's perfectly possible to um, call yourself a pagan and just be a pagan and not do witchcraft. Um, and there are people who will you know, worship um, old forms of deity um, that, that they that kind of recovered from pre-Christian times and, and do that in essentially a kind of purely religious and spiritual way. I think they're probably in the minority, but there are people who will do that. And then there are a whole, in the middle, loads and loads and loads of people who would be very happy to be identified as pagans and practice a general form of witchcraft, but nothing too um, deep or dark or difficult. And I suppose, um, I don't want this to, to sound arrogant, but it is the practice of witchcraft that's always been, uh, in, in a very sort of deep and all-consuming way, that's been the guiding principle of my life. So that's the most important thing to me, and I would identify um, as a witch and with people across a whole variety of different forms of witchcraft. I'm happy to be called a pagan if people find it helpful. Um, in the wide world. What, what about the term Wicca? Does that hold any validity for you? Wicca? Yeah. Um, well, yes. Um, what does it and mean? again, it, it, kind of, it kind of gets much maligned, but I think that um, what uh, Gerald Gardner, Doreen Valiente, Alexanders, and all the people um, who made Wicca a real 
force, you know, from the 1950s right through did was quite a wonderful thing because they were... It, it doesn't matter to me whether it's old or not, but my perception is that what they were doing was um, gathering together lots of surviving traditions and practices and then marrying those up with, with magical techniques and having um, been initiated into Wicca and worked it for many years. I think if it's done sort of... I was going to say properly, but who am I to say what's properly? If it's done in a really deep and committed way, it's a really powerful magical system that works. I, I'm not at all bothered about things being ancient. You know, so if you go out tomorrow and discover um, the most fabulously effective form of witchcraft and magical working that the universe has ever seen, and it's totally new, and it has no history, I don't mind at all. I'm not wedded mm -hmm. to the idea of the deep past. Yeah. So I think Wicca's, um, if worked as a magical system, has an awful lot to teach people. I'm, I'm not so wild about the sort of um, you can read one self-help book and then go out and do it yourself version um, because I think it needs more study than that. But having said that, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the term but um, I'm also fine with the other forms of witchcraft, the traditional witchcraft. I don't see um, that there should be any real division or enmity between them because having having worked most of them they are actually mostly trying to do the same thing and i'm, I'm not interested in claiming territory mm -hmm. peter gray yeah. scarlet imprint has just published a very interesting book it's called apocalyptic witchcraft and it's peter's particular take on witchcraft but it's basically saying something quite similar i mean quite a wonderfully um angry and polemical way which is that there's there's no point. Now, now, going back to your book, A Witch's Mirror, The Art of Making Magic, um, now you've juxtaposed practical and ritualistic magic. And um, what my question is, is how would that pertain to uh, traditional Golden Dawn rituals, which the Golden Dawn is obviously, it seems to me anyways, from the outside, to be entirely based on ritual and formal ritual. Well, the, the, the Witch's Mirror book, has very little of ritual magic in it, okay? It, it, it is not really about that. I and mean, I, I do not um, lay down for people how to do rituals because I, my starting point is that anyone reading this will find their own um, tradition to work within, you know, be it a self-taught one, be it Wicca, be it, be it any other form of magical witchcraft. So this book is, is about practical experiential techniques um so so there is there isn't actually much of ritual magic per se in the book but what i would say is that the way i describe techniques such as um sitting out on a beach all day for 12 hours for a whole tide so that you you go there at a particular stage of the tide so say for example you um go at low tide you stay there for six hours while the tide comes in and then another six hours while the tide goes out again to experience the whole tide. And I'm describing, I hope, um, deep meditational practices and states that you do during that time. And for sure, those have been informed by my own knowledge of, uh, of ritual magic and the way that that teaches um, very intense forms of meditation and concentration and the use of the will. I do refer... Um, fairly constantly through the book to the use of the will and that's a term that I'm using in the sense that a pra practitioner of ritual magic would describe it because it seems to be the best way to um, describe magical desire and concentration. It sounds like you're offering a fresh uh, new kind of perspective on uh, a, more, a more personal magic that is less institutional and less formalized, obviously, as you say. And that, that, that actually sounds really good to me. It sounds like you're sort of offering up a, a truer form of witchcraft and perhaps one that's more beneficial and, I dare say, positive. Well, thank you. It's really, it's really kind of you to say, although I can't, um, I, can't, I can't claim that anything I do is true or authoritative because I don't believe that that's the way that witches work. It's just what I've done. 
Um, and I've been doing it for over 30 years, and it's worked. Uh, it's worked for me, and I've taught it to other people, and it's worked for them. So I'm hoping that other people will look at the book, get interested in it, and that it, that it will work for them too. But I, I can't, you know, it, it, and it is personal, and it isn't institutional at all. My vision for people using this book is that whatever tradition they come from, they could pick up on some of the stuff in it and think, oh, yeah, I'll do that. You know, I'll make one of those, or I, I, I'll spend that day on the beach or um, sitting next to a hedgerow or, or whatever. And it, so I've been really careful in writing it not to be prescriptive about what tradition, you know, or path pe- people are coming from. So, yeah, I hope people could, could pick up and use it, but I, can't, I, I really wouldn't like to claim at all that it was sort of ultimately authoritative and true, um, only in the sense that anyone's personal experience that works is, really. Well, that, that actually lends, lends it uh, uh, credibility to me because it makes it sound like you're offering up your own personal wisdom and, and experience. Yeah, that's what it is. It's exactly that's my own, own personal experience. And, you know, I guess some people read it and think, well, my personal experience is completely different and, and this, this doesn't interest me, but, you know, I'm hoping that other people will think, well, yeah, you know, that, that experience is, is really useful and I can use that and, and I hope they will. Yeah, and I think that, I think with this new age that we're in now, the age of Aquarius, I think that, um, I think it's okay to maybe start sharing spiritual experiences, whereas before it was kind of frowned upon as being something, maybe perhaps you're being arrogant or something. I think it's probably better to give that to people who are receptive to it or want to hear it, you know? Why not? I think, yeah, I, th- I think it's okay. And I suppose my other starting point is that I think I was incredibly lucky to know both Cecil Williamson and George Harrowood Wake. And um, when I was first learning witchcraft, you couldn't go out and buy books on it. The, the web hadn't happened. So you couldn't go on, you know, several thousand teen rich websites. And um, the only way you could really learn it was from someone teaching it you. And so I was really lucky because I had two fantastic teachers. And so I sort of feel that part of my debt of gratitude, if you like, to them, is that I should pass on what I've learned to other people. I, I don't mean pass on in the sense of, you know, betraying the very personal content of rituals that other people would, would you know, would find distressing and they haven't done that. But just the techniques that I was taught. Because, you know, what, what a fantastic gift they gave me. So I, I would really like to pass that on. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with passing on your own spiritual experience if other people, um, if other people want to hear about it. And I suppose, um, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm with Alistair Crowley on his um, lovely sarcastic quote, which I think was about the Golden Dawn, which was, I can't remember the exact words, but it's about people who swear you to secrecy and then teach you the Hebrew alphabet. Yeah, there are some things that you don't want to share with other people because they're private and they're intense emotional and magical and spiritual experiences. So you don't share those. But there are plenty of other, other things that you can. And I, I do think, you know, if someone's given you that, then maybe you have a duty to, to give it on in its turn because it, it's, it's the best thing anyone could give you, in my view. Can you tell us about some of your memories with um, either Wake or Williamson um, and what they taught you? Okay. Well, just some, just some really... A couple of really practical, for instances, um, one with one with Harrowood Wake. Um, I mean, apart from learning how to how to how to work with the gods, um, how how to really put into operation the, the magician saying to know, to will, to dare, and to keep silent, and very Im- important things about how to how to act and how not to act. Here's here's a more um, here's a more light-hearted one. Uh, we used to go to a place on Dartmoor to work um, called the Tolman Stone. And the Tolman Stone is a boulder, a huge Ice Age erratic boulder set into the bank uh, of the East Teen River um, up, on, up on Dartmoor, in the northern part of Dartmoor. And it's got a huge hole in it from top to bottom. And so a very traditional... Um, Devon initiation custom was that before you could join a coven, you had to climb three times through this hole in the Tolman Stone. It's a vertical hole, 
and it's maybe seven or eight feet from top to bottom and unless it's not been raining for several years which seems not to happen here anymore um, the river is um, swirling around your knees at the bottom of, 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 of the thing so it's quite a big thing to do we used to work there so we went off to the Talman Stone um, did our work and then we came to walk home or home in this case back we, we, we'd left the vehicle um, it was really simple it was straightforward the path was straight ahead it was over a big broad hill um, and it had a path running up the middle of it and we couldn't see it um, it, and it sort of disappeared into a general whiteness that didn't feel like mist. It was just nothing was there anymore. And it was quite scary. And we were sort of thinking, well, the path must be over there, but I can't see it. Where is it? This is ridiculous. This is a straightforward walk, you know. And um, Harrowood just said, oh, well, I know what's happening. We're being pisky led Piskies, of course, being the native spirits of Dartmoor, who are very mischievous and like confounding and confusing clever people especially witches who think they know it all and that that one of their really tr well their tricks is that they will lead you completely astray and get you lost make paths disappear so <laughs> he said what do we do and he said well you take the traditional devon remedy you you take off your outer layer of clothing turn it inside out and back to front and put it on again <laughs> and respectfully um you know ask for the permission of of the piskies to to find your way home. And I'm thinking, you know, this is like a year into my trajectory of Cabin Witchcraft with Harold, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> and we did it. We did it, and the path appeared. Home we went. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, magic. So, you know, that, that, that's a kind of practical, but, but I suppose quite lighthearted thing. And you said um, you did, you mentioned doing work. What, what do you specifically mean by that? Um, making a circle... Um, honouring the old gods, and um, there on on that occasion, I am betraying any conf confidences. Right. There was someone who was going to, um, within the next month, I think at the next full moon, do their first degree initiation. So they had to climb three times through the Tolman Stone. Okay, all right. So that's what I mean by doing work. Sorry, that's terrible shorthand, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's just, it's just, uh, yeah, it's jargon that I'm not familiar with. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. And so what, um, what about Williamson? Uh, now, yeah. did you participate in any kind of dark uh, ceremonies or rituals with him? Well, what he taught me was how to do solo magic, how to do spells, um, how to find the right places to work. So if you walk, if you walk through a forest, uh, um, you know, you might want to stop and um, contact the spirits of that place, uh, make a spell or some other kind of operative magic. So um, he would know exactly the techniques you needed to find the right spots and how that was different from all the others. So I didn't, um, I didn't participate in actual uh, group ceremonies with him. And I think by this stage in his life, you know, it was in the 70s um, when I met him, um, that wasn't really too much what he was doing, and a lot of his life was about solo magic. But I'll tell you um, about a, a spell, I think. Um, Cecil um, would do a lot of magic for other people, and there's, um, there's a quite well-known spell in witchcraft, which is that if you want to banish something or return something of bad intent to its sender, what you do is you um, set up a candle in front of your witch's mirror, which may be a black mirror or an ordinary mirror, but the mirror that you use for magic making, and you take a needle and you incise into the candle um, something that represents what it is that you want to return to its not very well-intentioned sender. And then you... Um, below your what you've incised you poke the needle right through the candle so that you know end is sticking out each side of it you then light the candle um having done your various magical bits of concentration and invocation and you leave it to burn and it burns till it's gone and you you come back uh, when it's gone having left it undisturbed and the you know the, the needle is on the floor which is how you know the spell's been sent and that's a really well-known spell in witchcraft which lots of people use and Cecil would say, well, yeah, that's okay. That's 
all very well, but his had a sort of extra twist, um, which was that he said, what you really want is to make some kind of much more immediate and deep connection with um, the whole business of returning and sending back. And so he said, well, you will have... Think of, think of something that the, the sender of this bad stuff will have in their house. Um, and something that you will have. And, and I'm thinking, yes, but Cecil, I don't know them. You know, I don't know who they are, and I don't know what they'll have, etc. And he said, no, it's simple. You have a cobweb in your house, and so will they. So you find a cobweb in your house, and you um, go and respectfully buy the cobweb off the spider. You smear the cobweb onto your mirror, and as you're focusing and concentrating your magical will, um, you are using um, the spider and its web like a sort of radio link with a, spy, with a spider and its web in the living space of the person who's, who's sent this stuff. And um, so I, I took down the spell and not very long afterwards I used it. Someone I worked with was being bullied really unpleasantly and in quite a sexual way. And uh, the person who was doing it was really having a horrible effect on them and um, the, 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 the bullied person said will you help me and so I used Cecil spell and the effects were absolutely immediate and drastic um, this was a workplace issue and the next day um, I went into work and discovered that this I'm not going to go into all the details because that would be sort of really unfair but the person who'd done the bullying had been suspended oh wow okay. um, and was subsequently sacked. And I was quite shocked because I hadn't really experienced magic working so instantly and totally before. Well, that, um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a fascinating uh, spell. I've never heard anything like it. I, I mean, I have to tell you that I don't think I was as good at handling it as Cecil was because I'd never done anything like that before. This is going back a long time um, to the early 1990s. And um, I, uh, I, I knew it was a sort of work. And one of the reasons that I knew was I felt very lethargic and depressed for a couple of weeks afterwards in Why? a quite uncharacteristic way. So basically, you know, the magic of work, but it had, it, it had taken it out of me as well. And I think Cecil, it wouldn't have done with Cecil because he was so adept at doing this stuff. Now, where do you think Cecil... Uh or learn this, these things? Did he, was he making them up? Was he reading them in old books? Was he um, inheriting them from people he knew in, in Cornwall? I think all of the above, really. Wow. He, um, I think he was, he was finding out about surviving instances of magic that worked from all over Cornwall and Devon and other places, too. And he records lots and lots of those in the museum and in, in his writings and all the rest of it. So he's collecting um, lots and lots of operative magic. He, um, he was part of the occult community um, in the UK during his youth and middle years, very much so. You know, he worked with Gardner, he knew Crowley, he, 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 he was very involved with all those people, so he had that aspect going on as well. And I think as well, from everything I knew about him, he was a very creative magician, so he could take all those things and weave them into sort of his own synthesis that was highly effective. I, I don't think I've ever met... Um, anyone who was such an effective uh, magician in all senses of the word as, as Cecil Williamson. Now, to put a little bit of a conspiracy theory angle on it, obviously it seems like one of the agendas of basically the United Nations or anyone who espouses the New Age or creating an, a new age or a new world order um, ha has, has basically ties with uh, anti-Catholicism, if you want to put it that way, or uh, paganism, or whatever we want to call it, right? So, is there any possibility that that it was part of Cecil Williamson's objective to establish the Museum of Witchcraft or a, a witchcraft uh, community in in England as a, as a countermeasure directed against the old world order? Oh, good goddess, no! I don't think so for a minute. No, um, I, I, I think um, far more Cecil and people like him saw what they were doing as a personal passion that they had no choice about doing because it drove them, you know. It was a really defining factor in their lives, it is for many of us. But 
No, no. The idea that he was um, part of a larger movement, I think he would have um, had a real giggle at. Um, you know, apart from anything else, he was an incredibly patriotic Englishman. Um, very, very, very different to me in that respect. A uh, very old-style patriotic person who'd, you know, worked really hard for his country during the Second World War and, 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 and was in, in many ways a, a great friend of the establishment, although, you know, in his personal practice that it was very different. But no, I, I really don't think so. No, but that's, that's my point, though. I think that um, maybe, uh, maybe we're doubting, like, the establishment when perhaps we should be considering that maybe the establishment actually had similar objectives to those of the counterculture all along. Mm, I'd, I'd need to think a lot more about it. It's not, it's not an idea I'd instantly go for, I have to say. Um, I'll, give, I'll not... give you an example, though. Um, you, know, uh, you know Echo and the Bunnymen, uh, they have an album called Ocean Rain? Yes. And it's just the most beautiful pop rock album ever made. Yes, I mean, basically. It is, isn't it? And, yeah. you know, just, if you compare the lyrics to, to other songs that they made up for other albums, it doesn't really seem, it seems possible that the lyrics were ghostwritten, that could have been ghostwritten. And it makes me think, well, who, if they were ghostwritten, just hypothetically, who would have been writing them? Who would have know? ghostwritten them? You know, who would have done it and mm. why? Why would they include lyrics like, bring on the new Messiah, you know? That's what oh, I'm talking about. That's, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Maybe Cecil Williamson, if he did have some sort of objective, social, social objective is all I'm saying, it, maybe it wasn't a bad thing. Maybe it, was, maybe it was right in line with all of the stuff that he was doing exoterically. You, you see what I'm saying? And his esoteric life was mirroring his, eso, his exoteric life. Well, mm, I, I don't know. I mean, I knew him pretty well towards the end of his life. And... I think he delighted in being a trickster, in overthrowing ideas and confounding people's objectives and suppositions. And I find it really hard to think of him as sort of being part of any kind of movement or in line with enough people to do that. I now keep an open mind, but I'm, I'm not... I, I, mm. I'm afraid I don't really see that with him. Like I, I can, I can buy the idea in, in other terms. You know, it sounds quite logical in the way that you're describing it. But I'd be really surprised if if he was, um, if if that was the way he saw the world. Actually, what one other question on that uh, topic is: uh, what about what is the Tavistock Institute, and does it have anything to do with Tavistock in in Devon? You mean the Tavistock Clinic? Tavistock. Oh, I, well, I think Tavistock was some sort of think tank type thing. Uh, maybe it was in London, but I'm wondering if it it's was in, in It's Tavistock. in London, and it's about clinical psychology. Oh, okay. And I don't know what... I think it's in Tavistock Square, and I don't think it has any connection um, really with, uh, with, with Devon or anything that I know of. I think it's just named after where it happens to be in London. Did Tavistock Institute have any connection with uh, Alistair Crowley that you know of or no? I don't know. Okay. Uh, I'd be surprised, but I don't know. Yeah, it's, all right. It's, it's, okay, so, um, so what I was going to ask you about is, um, is, is witch hunters, the tradition of witch, witch hunters in England. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, that climaxed in the Puritan era. Yeah. Um, are there still any kind of uh, witch hunters that you have ever come across or heard of? Um, that are kind of against, you know, witchcraft in the UK and, and, its, and its modern resur resurgence? Well, um, when um, I started practicing witchcraft in, in a way that possibly quite ill-advisedly at the time that wasn't completely private and people knew of my existence um, in the late 1980s, I got very threatening phone calls from Christian fundamentalists. They weren't witch hunters per se, but they were sort of um, threatening my soul and hinting that it might be helpful to have my house burned down. Wow. <laughs> so that, you know, so that I could go and commune with the devil properly in the afterlife. At that time, you know, there were a few crazy people um, around and um, I just put the matter in the hands of the police, actually. Um, I thought, well, that's what you do. That's what you do with uh, threatening phone calls. So um, it was kind of my own direct experience. And I think there was 
um, again, you know, end of the 80s, beginning of 90s, there were certainly a lot of instances of discrimination, um, nasty discrimination against uh, witches and pagans. It's one of the things that the dear old pagan federation you know, tackled a lot. So you could, if, you, if it became known that you were a witch, you could lose your job, um, depending on what kind of place you worked in. But particularly if you employed in education, um, teaching children, you know, you, you, if you're a pagan or a witch, you could, you could lose your job. And uh, worse, um, people's practice of witchcraft or paganism was used, used against them in child custody cases. Um, I think the Pagan Federation mobilized quite, you know, strongly and successfully against that, provided specialist witnesses in court cases, et cetera, et cetera. And, in, and, and that's sort of gone away. You, 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 you hear about an isolated outbreak of it here and there um, very occasionally. These days. It's usually stamped on before it gets anywhere because, um, you know, Britain's changed and the whole idea of multi-face means that these things are more accepted. So I think what I would say, I haven't, haven't kind of met um, modern witch hunters, but I've met, you know, people who who would discriminate really about, uh, badly against witches and pagans and also feel, feel free to threaten them. Um, not recently. Um, interestingly, though, um, Exeter, which is the, you know, the county, county town, city of Devon, and is quite close to where I live, was the site of the last judicial execution for witchcraft in 1684 and 1685. I was part of a bunch of witches in the early 1990s who got a memorial put up to the last four people, the last four women who, who were, you know, the victims of those trials. So, it, you know, that's interesting. Th those were the last um, judicial murders of witches in now, England. Now, that famous witch hunter in the Puritan era, he came from, he came from Essex, right? Do you know what Yeah, Matthew about? Hopkins, the man who styled himself the witch finder general. Yeah, he, he, he was in, in Essex, um, East Anglia, the other side of London, and I know people who studied him, but that's a completely different part of the country from me. So well, that's what they, I was going to ask. I mean, is, yeah. is, was Cornwall more of a hotbed of, of witchcraft um, than, than other parts of the UK? Um, well, it would be interesting to talk to a historian such as Ronald Hutton about that, you know, where the, where the witch trials took place in England. Um, not aware of any... Um, uh, staggeringly nasty ones in the Puritan period in Cornwall, although um, in the 18th, uh, no, it's the beginning of the 19th century, um, one of the last sort of self-proclaimed witches to die in jail was in, in, in Bodmin Jail in Cornwall. Um, she wasn't, she, she was, a, 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 she'd been held in jail for all sorts of crimes, mainly to do with vagrancy rather than witchcraft, and she, she was Joan Witt, the fighting fairy woman of Bodmin. Um, so, so, you know, the, there was that. Um, what, I, uh, what I learned a little bit about was the interesting thing is that um, there was almost no witch persecution in Wales um, oh. because Wales still had its own forms of Welsh law that predated its sort of enforced union with England. And so um, what, you, uh, what was likely to happen to you in Wales if you accused someone of witchcraft was that you would get done for libel or defamation. So you tended not to do it. So Wales is very underrepresented in witch executions. But what we do know is that this horrible thing of the last um, executions for witchcraft were in Devon. And, and that was a real witch hunt. Um, this was basically... Um, three old ladies in Biddeford, in North Devon, and um, they were, uh, their, their neighbor's child, 12-year-old um, uh, girl, and a friend became very, very ill, didn't die, but, but nearly died. And when you read the account of the trial, it's pretty obvious that what these two children had was anorexia and bulimia. And <laughs> the symptoms are described, but the belief at the time in Biddeford was that um, 
these three elderly women who, you know, were your typical idea of a 17th century witch, were elderly, friends with each other but lived alone, and oh my God, one of them had a cat, you know, um, <laughs> were, must, must have caused these deaths. And there was an extraordinary sort of mass outbreak of panic about these three witches. Um, and they were taken. They were taken to Exeter, imprisoned in you know, filthy conditions in the usual 17th century airless cellar of a dungeon, and tried. And and I think it's um, one of the first witch trials where all the details are written down. Um, absolutely, absolutely everything. Un- unlike earlier ones, so it's a really interesting record. And um, the the. The judge was a kind of man of fairly modern opinions who clearly didn't want to convict the, these women, but um, was told that the, um, the, the militia and, and, you know, what have you, would not have been able to maintain law and order in North Devon if he didn't, um, because the panic about their activities was so great, which tells you, um, you know, a lot about the contemporary attitude to, to, to witchcraft in, in, in Devon at the time on the part of ordinary people and also, you know, the, the, the way that people could be scapegoated as outsiders. So they were convicted of witchcraft, uh, sentenced to death. What the judge intended was was that the king would, would pardon them because this was 1684, so it was kind of 20 years after the last big, you know, heyday of witchcraft trials. Um, but it didn't happen, so, so they died. Um, so, you know, it's a, but that was the last time that, that, that there were popular um, kind of lynchings. Yeah, that's what it that. sounds like, a lynch mob, you know. There were, there were lynch mobs yeah. in various places into the 18th century, but that was the last time that the English state oh, right, um, right, yeah. execu- executed witches, you know, judicial murder for witchcraft. That was the last time. In A Witch's Mirror, uh, you touch upon the theme of interacting with the spirit world. Now, is that through scrying? And if it is through scrying, what else, what else, how else could you go about that? It's through all sorts of ways. Um, scrying is one of the principal ones, and I do it through, um, through looking into a black mirror um, at, or um, uh, a bowl full of water. Um, there's, all sorts of, there's all sorts of ways you can use, but... Um, I also describe the techniques that you need to do that, which are essentially that you put yourself into a light trance state, so you use the surface of the mirror or the water as a sort of veil that you, 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 you stop seeing it as a surface and you, you go beyond it and you, um, you either go into the spirit world or you see spirits in the world with you. But then that's one way of doing it, but I also describe sitting out, which is a very old practice, which is... Um, sitting out in the landscape and again using various techniques uh, of, of concentration and meditation which I describe in the book to um, interact with the spirit world, put yourself into a trance state where you become um, very much more aware of the spirit aspects of the place around you so that its appearance changes and your, your perceptions of it change and you, uh, you then work with what is there. So that theme of working in the spirit world is a constant in the book, really, in lots of different ways. And uh, scrying is a very effective way of doing it. Probably, um, in some ways, easier than um, sitting out, um, but also not to be undertaken lightly. <laughs> And it states in the book description that um, you do not need any specialist art or craft skills, just enthusiasm, yeah. dedication, and desire to work magic. The, the way I was taught by Harry Dwight was that you didn't go out and buy fancy tools and things to work magic with. You made them yourself. And he, he would go to extreme lengths to make everything. So if there was um, a cup or a bowl needed for um, libations or... Um, you know, sharing, uh, sharing uh, whatever it is you drink during a, a festival, he would somehow make that himself. And so uh, my approach in the book is that everything you do with magic, um, you can actually make for yourself. And you can also do it at fairly low, low cost with, with recycled stuff, stuff that you find, stuff that you buy for pennies at jumble sales or, or car boot sales. And I was quite, I was quite keen to say that because in the 
year since I learned all that from Harrywood. You know, it's extraordinary sort of neo-pagan industry has grown up of selling people little charms in bags and ready-made spells. And although in some ways I suppose it's very nice for people earning some money out of doing it, in another way it's a, a terrible shame because I firmly believe that these things should be made yourself and they are quite simple to do. Um, so yeah, you, you know, you don't, you don't need specialist art and craft skills, but you know, if you're determined, you, you can make all these things. And you said that magic is something that should be lived. Yeah, well, I think, again, it's, I'm, I'm saying that because I have a sense at the moment that uh, people say, yes, well, I'm a pagan and I do a bit of magic, but when you find out what it is to do, it's actually not very much, if anything at all. And I think, for me, if you practice magic, it sort of, sort of should lead your life, really. It should be the most important thing. So it shouldn't just be something that you maybe do on the night of the full moon. Um, and then put away for a month. It, sh- it should be the guiding principle so that it becomes the, um, the way in which you see the world and it shifts your relationship with, with the world around you so that everything you do, you do from a magical perspective, not just in a very sort of part-time way. How do you put that into practice, for example? Uh, like, let's, let's say you're walking through the woods or through the fields or something in England and you come up pro- upon a stream or a river can you give us an idea what we okay. would do, what you would do? Well, um, if, I, if I was walking with magical intent, I would be very aware um, to start with when I started that of my own breathing and the way that my feet touched the ground you know, every, every time I took a step. So I would be, to start off with, I would be putting myself present in the moment as fully as possible. I would be shutting off um, all the irritating thoughts about the world outside of what I was doing, you know, what I was going to cook for dinner the next day, how I was going to organize my life, all those things that um, get in, you know, the everyday babble that gets in the way of our minds. So I would be making myself as aware and present as possible. And then I would start looking in great detail around me and when I talk about um, sitting out for example talk about um, focusing on tiny little details around you on a blade of grass a small pebble or something and, and seeing everything you can see and then doing the same with your sense of hearing your sense of smell your sense of touch so on the one hand you know be, being as fully present and aware of the physical world as you can and then that leads you um, into um, the paradoxically <laughs> into um, the, the sort of trans state in which the physical the, the ex- well yeah, you see the, the physical world doesn't fall away but you become aware of the spirit aspects of the place that you're in so instead of just saying oh well I'm walking across the field and there's a little stream here you would see those things in a completely different way um, you, you, you might well uh, see the spirits that inhabited them or you might be told things, you know, words and thoughts would, would come into your mind that you no idea where they came from but later you'd recognize came from the place itself. Does that, does that help? Yeah, in fact, it sounds beautiful and it sounds like, it sounds like it's something I've never heard before at all. Really? And, um, no, and it sounds like reverse meditation so that it's still meditation but it's going, uh, it's looking towards the out outer world instead instead of turning inward uh and i was raised in a in a tradition or i was raised in a cult actually in california that's based in hinduism and i was taught to meditate as a child and the whole um the whole gist of of the meditation technique that i was taught is that you're supposed to look inward but what you're describing is something i really have never heard before and it's fascinating is is observing and allow and allowing all of your senses to be acute and to be sensitive and and to experience your environment and by that by doing that you're actually going to reach the same place that you would if you were to turn inside and be still you're going to reach the same stillness yeah Yeah. no that's 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 absolutely the way of it and it's also um i think something for me about witchcraft is that it is very reverential of the physical world around us. You know, it, it, um, 
every tree, every rock, every pool of water, every stream has its own indwelling spirit. It's alive. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not dead matter. It's as alive as us. It has, it has its own consciousness just as we do. It's, it, it, it's, and, and, you know, it would be very arrogant, uh, in witchcraft, I think, to think otherwise. Otherwise. So if you want to, um, experience those aspects of the world yeah that's what you have to do you have to use the senses and you probably do um get to a similar place that you you get to with hindu meditation but you give it different names and you experience it slightly differently i think and i actually think that they're opposite practices because uh, now that i'm thinking about it you know christianity islam judaism buddhism all advocate in fact enforce uh basically killing the world uh, yeah. as a sacrifice to get you to heaven, right? Because the outer world is evil, and that's true of all those religions that I mentioned. Hinduism is kind of a different thing, but yeah. Hindus sacrifice, still sacrifice life for their deity. But what you're stating is actually opposite all of those in that it's a celebration of the physical world um, as a sort of representation of the, it may be perhaps the ethereal world or the universal uh, or universality itself, but not negating, not negating its, the inherent beauty of the natural world. Well, I think if you um, have a commitment to a pagan idea, I'm using the P word there, the pagan idea of deity, you know, to, however you want to envisage that, uh, whether it's in its pre-Christian forms or more modern forms, you have this you have the notion of of goddess and god out there as kind of making up the world, but also that you have extreme reverence for life, for the world, because everything in the world, you, you, you are a pantheist, essentially. Everything in the world is, is alive, has its own spirit, and has as much right to be here as we do, which is why you find so many witches and pagans of, involved in all sorts of um, ecological um, direct action, practical projects, etc. So, the idea of the idea that you know the mind and the body are separate things, and that by using the mind to sort of renounce the body um, and the, the life of the world, um, you'd achieve your spiritual objectives would just not work with, with, with witchcraft at all. And in that, it, it is the as I understand those traditions, it, although I've never been part of any of them except in my childhood, you know, Christ, Kent Christianity, we all got, um, you know, that, yeah, that is, that is really different. And, and when, uh, on the rare occasions, we kind of debate with people involved in those religions, that's what they find really hard to understand. You know, a Christian will say to you, oh, you're not worshipping God, you're worshipping the creation. And you have to kind of explain to them that your notion of the way the world is is completely different. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know, yeah, it, it, is, it is completely different. And you have to, in witchcraft, get away from the idea that the mind and the body are two separate things, which I think is damaging, you know. Yeah, what I've been noticing is that it seems to be all about apotheosis, turning man into God, yourself into God, you know, recognizing mm -hmm. that you are a deity, you know. Um, yeah. And that that's the real schism, and it is a real deep schism between, obviously, between Christianity or Catholicism and what Catholicism considers sat Satanism, yeah. um, but it's probably better term Luciferianism. Probably, yeah, and, and of course, you know, um, that idea is something that I think deep witchcraft and ritual magic absolutely share. I'm sure it came from the same place, uh, which is that you, you have part of deity within you, and you can become like the gods. Um, no mean feat, I would say, but yeah, you know, and that, that is... Again, you know, that's, uh, I think, deeply heretical to, to, to Christianity. I don't know enough about Catholicism, you know, the particular bits of Catholicism. I never really had practical experience of that, that tradition, but yeah. You know, in an almost clear sky, I was just looking out the window and I saw a bolt of lightning. <laughs> and what, because what I was about to say is that who would have thought 20 years ago even that the entire world paradigm would be reversed and that Luciferianism would arise to be a more legitimate uh, direction to run with. 
But well, at the same time, well, at the same time, I'll qualify that by stating that I actually believe that there's a, there's there we have two um, responsibilities as human beings to be balanced. One is to assert our godliness, but the other is to receive godliness. In other words, be man and uh, God and yeah. man at the same time, but but not neglect being receptive as well, and, and then we're truly balanced. And that's why I think that um, all of these organized religions are, are not wrong at all. It's just that they only have half of the truth. And, the, and then you could even apply that also to counterculturalists or uh, witches or, or pagans in mm -hmm. that they're, they're actually facing the other direction and saying, no, you can't be receptive. Although, obviously, it could be argued that that's not the case with many witches, and I, I would accept that completely. But um, many Satanists, for, for instance, the San Francisco variety, would, would say, no, you're not supposed to be receptive. You're supposed to be completely satanic, completely um, male, completely um, thrusting, <laughs> thrusting forth. But no, you have, to be, mm. you have to be male and female in order to be balanced. You know? Yeah. Well, never having been to San Francisco, no. <laughs> um, had much to do with San Francisco Satanists, so I kind of couldn't comments on their own practice but I yeah I, I do agree with you saying with what you're saying I think that duty to be receptive is really important um, uh, but I think in, in witchcraft it's also thinking about how you view the world around us and you know that that um, the world around us has been so neglected in the organized religions who see it as a problem um, rather than a joy and a beauty and something to be loved and cherished um, so I think there has to be that thinking about the world around us as well, and you know, hence that approach of by being fully in this world, can you, you know, that way, that is the way that you go forward into the deeper realms of magic, not by neglecting it. Can you tell us um, where we can get your book? It's called A Witch's A Witch's Mirror: The Art of Making Magic, and it's yes. by Livana Morgan, who we're speaking with. And Livana's L E V A double N A H. Morgan is M O R G A N, and it's That's a new so rele correct. newly released book, uh, which you just had a launch party for in Cornwall. And um, so, where should we go to get that book? Okay, well, it's published by uh, a really uh, wonderful. A magical and witchcraft press called Capel Ban. Um, that is C A P A L L, one word, and then B A N N. And you can find their website on the web. Um, you can buy the book direct from them. And it is also available via Amazon. It's obviously nicer for the small publisher if you buy it from them rather than Amazon, if you can do that. And um, I gather it is going to be available in shops too, although I and the publishers don't really have any control over that. That's dependent on them ordering it. So the best ways to buy it are from Capelban or, if you prefer, from Amazon. Okay, I'll have links up to both of those. Um, Thank you. And I'll have a link first to Capelban and then also... a. Uh, link with a picture to Amazon so you can see the cover of the book. Um, okay. So that's great. So thank you very much, Levon. It was excellent to speak with you today. Thank you, Jesse. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Great Work Radio. The Great Work Radio and blog are features of Jesse War's website and can be accessed at jessewar.com. That's J E S S E W A U G H dot com. We look forward to comments submitted to the blog and hope you enjoyed today's program. To download the Great Work Radio program files, just search for the name Jesse War in the iTunes Store. Mm -hmm.